When the 88th American Infantry Division approached the shallow valley of the River Hammer in the late April 1945, the landscape was a welcome variation from what they had seen in Germany in the previous months. The southern part of Bavaria, and the Bavarian Alps in particular, seemed mostly untouched by the war. When they entered the small town of Oberhammergau, the 29th of April, there was no resistance, no visible destruction, no sign of war at all. Actually, their mission was to cross the Alps and make contact with the Allied forces advancing from Italy. And thus far, it seemed just at the beginning of a pleasant journey. That was the reason why their discovery left them utterly astonished. Welcome to Millennium 7 Star, the channel that helps you make sense of military history and military technology. Please, stay with me till the end, because the stuff that we discuss here are not easily found anywhere else on YouTube. Just outside the town, the Hotzendorf Jäger Kaserne, an old mountain troops training complex, had been taken over by the Messerschmitt aeronautical industry and it was turned into a research and development facility. There, far from the areas attacked by the Allied bombers, designers and technicians could work in relative safety to the new generation of the Nazi air power. While from the outside not many changes to the compound were visible, inside the mountain nearby kilometers of tunnels were dug to enlarge the facility. When the Americans arrived, Nobody scrambled to destroy the documentation and the drawings or the prototypes. Actually, part of the Messerschmitt personnel was still there and they warmly welcomed the newcomers because they knew that they had something to sell to the Allied powers. They could sell themselves and their work. The Oberammergau complex was a treasure trove, an Aladdin's cave of advanced aeronautical technology. The units in charge of hoovering all the relevant German technology hurried to the complex. The Fedden mission, the British group in charge of acquiring all the German aeronautical technology they could put their hands on, reached the Oberammergau on the 22nd of June 1945. In their final report, they recorded all the visitors who had been there from the discovery of the complex. An American team from the Operation Lasty, a very secretive French unit, a team from the United States Strategic Forces in Europe, a civilian expedition from the American aircraft manufacturer Bell, a party from the British de Havilland Industries and the Fadden mission itself. All of them happily intent to harvesting knowledge, people and technology. There was a large variety of all kinds of planes uh, from the operational jets like the Messerschmitt 262 to the, well, to the rocket planes, the Messerschmitt 163, but also many more exotic prototypes and drawings like flying wings, toilet, tailless aircrafts and the delta wing precursors. But for our story, we are interested in one particular plane. The prototype of the Messerschmitt 1101 was found in an advanced state of completion in one of the tunnels under the mountain. It was designed to be the second generation jet fighter for the Nazi Germany. In the end, it was relatively simple, with a single engine positioned below the fuselage, uh, the classic round nose air intake of the first jets, and an underslung engine with a long tail boom. That simple jet, however, included not one, but two revolutionary technologies. It had a swept back wing, and the wing sweep was variable. Well, to be precise, the wing sweep could only be changed on the ground, but still. During the summer of 1945, Messerschmitt chief designer Voldemar Freud and Robert J. Hoods of Bell Aircraft 
try to obtain funds from the military administration to complete the prototype. However, it turned out that some essential drawings had been already acquired by the French and they were not returned. Eventually, the airframe was shipped to the USA and ended up in Buffalo at the Bell Aircraft Works in 1948. There, it was studied in depth by the Bell engineers. The prototype was never completed, but it will inspire the forefather of an entire generation of combat planes. Robert J. Woods, chief designer at Bell, had been in Germany a few years before, and he never forgot the Messerschmitt 1101. In 1948, he proposed to build an improved version of the German fighter. The NACA, the NASA predecessor, was supporting the proposal even because they conducted a few years before a wind tunnel testing campaign with variable sweep wings. It took a little while to have access to United States Air Force funding, but in February 1949, Bell finally received the go-ahead to build the next plane closely inspired by the German prototype. The Bell X-5 flew for the first time in June 1951, and yes, it seemed a twin of the Messerschmitt 1101. Seen side by side, the two planes showed a clear resemblance. However, the purpose of the X-5 was not to fight, at least not immediately. Its purpose was to investigate and experiment the behavior of the variable geometry wing. The plane had a complicated mechanism that could change the wing sweep while in flight. The sweep could change from 20 to 60 degrees, and since the position of the center of gravity and the center of pressure did vary with the sweep, the wing also moved backwards and forwards on rails to maintain the longitudinal stability. Actually, and quite funnily, if the electric actuators did fail, the pilot could hand crank the wing in the desired position. I honestly can't tell for sure, but I suspect that the small tail planes were motivated by the fact that such a control of the reciprocal position of the two centers was expected to require just a small downforce to keep the longitudinal stability, thus reducing the overall drag as an added bonus. The plane wasn't liked at all by the pilots. It turned out to be very difficult to fly in and even dangerous. The spin recovery in particular turned out to be very difficult, requiring a loss of altitude of many thousands of meters. This feature was probably more connected with the overall design uh, of the plane, uh, with the engine thrust not aligned with the aerodynamic center of drag, and with the small tail planes rather than with the variable geometry wing. In October 1953, one of the two prototypes crashed exactly because spin recovery was unsuccessful, killing the pilot. The plane nonetheless provided invaluable information on the behavior of variable sweep wings and it proved that the wing sweep could be changed safely in flight and in doing so, the plane behavior changed accordingly. The main lesson learned was that the mechanism as it was built was complex, heavy and unpractical, and indeed the variation of center of gravity and aerodynamic center was high and much more difficult to be managed than expected. The center of gravity moves slightly forward, the aerodynamic center moved back quite a lot and the plane could become too stable and nose heavy in pitch. NACA engineers recommended, after the extensive test campaign, to use a simple hinge placed outside of the fuselage on a fixed wing section near the route. The plane flew till October 1955 and it may be interesting to know that the young Neil Armstrong flew the last flight of the Bell X-5 and that was his only flight on the plane. And he was nearly killed in that flight, by the way. <laughs> 
During the same years, the United States Navy was also interested in the Zwing Wing because it seemed to be attractive for carrier operations. So, Grumman was commissioned the XF-10F Jaguar. It was originally derived by the, from the Panther, adding a two-position shoulder-mounted variable sweep uh, wing and a quite bizarre T-tail with a fully mobile stabulator actuated aerodynamically by another small four-plane connected to it. Uh, the project was plagued by continuous changes, reliability problems and engine problems. The strange tail was basically a sure recipe for pilot-induced oscillations, so the plane was almost uncontrollable most of the times. The only test pilot who ever flew it managed to survive for 32 flights before the entire program was cancelled. But even in this case, the variable sweep wing concept proved to be effective in changing the flight behavior in a beneficial way. The United States were not the only place in the world where the variable sweep wing was looked at with great interest. In the United Kingdom, Vickers Industries began experimenting with the concept even before the end of the war. Barnes Wallace, the designer of some of the most famous British air to ground weapons, had moved to testing futuristic configuration based on ovoidal shapes and wings placed well aft. This resulted in a series of catapult launched unmanned aerial vehicles whose control was supposed to happen by changing the geometry of the wings. The project was known as Wild Goose and generated a series of incredibly innovative designs. A spin-off from the project was called Green Lizard and it was expected to build a supersonic long-range surface-to-air missile to intercept Soviet bombers. When the Royal Air Force had a requirement for a supersonic high-altitude bomber and reconnaissance plane, Wallace came up with a sleek arrowhead-shaped tailless aircraft with slender swing wings pivoted at the aft end of the fuselage. Pod-mounted engines pivoted on the tips of the swing wings and also provided some directional control. Calling his the revolutionary design the Swallow, small-scale models were tested in Vickers wind tunnels with encouraging results. Scale flying models of the Swallow powered by rocket engines easily attained Mach 2.5 in flight tests. However, unfortunately, the plane was thought to be too advanced and the full development time too long, so the Royal Air Force did not select it, but it offered a contract to build a smaller experimental aircraft. Unfortunately, the infamous 1957 Defense White Book sever severely cut all the funds available. Vickers could access some joint research funds with NASA, where further testing in the wind tunnel uh, surfaced various problems, but the variable sweep wing proved once again its feasibility. Now, I am pretty sure that some of you by now have a burning question. Why the variable sweep wing is so interesting? Why so many studies and resources have been dedicated to this concept? Why the militaries around the world were deeply interested but no special interest was coming from the commercial aviation? Why would we want to change the sweep of a wing in flight? Well, all extremely good questions, and they are the subject of the next video in the series. Well, if you like this video, I am sure you will like the videos that are going to appear beside me in the meanwhile. Uh, uh, please like, dislike, subscribe and hit the bell so you won't miss anything. And if you could consider supporting the channel on Patreon or Subscribestar, that would be definitely amazing. In the meanwhile, thank you very, very much for watching. Stay safe, always stay safe and see you next time.